Hi again, Danielle, and uh, I'd like to apologize for the anticipated length of this video. Uh, I figured that I would have to do a little bit more than putting a little more effort than you have had to in your video response to the question, Is Feminism Hate? And uh, I am not, however, going to apologize as much as some people should. Uh, unlike others, I have some respect for my audience. I'm going to try and keep it under 45 minutes, and this video is hopefully uh, organized uh, and uh, and not too redundant uh, because I scripted it. So, all that said, this very long video is going to address the uh, one of the, the first, the second maybe, or third glib sound bites you offered in your video. And uh, that happens to be tied into what I discussed in the first video in this series which is that you don't think feminism is as powerful as Eric and I and many other people believe. This assumption in your part kind of rests on a secondary assumption, that women cannot be powerful or influential unless they hold positions of overt authority and power. I mean, I'm guessing that your belief is because women did not have the vote or the same legal rights as men, they had no say or influence over how society operated it. Uh, and this assumption itself rests on a tertiary assumption, which is the basis of feminist ideology, that the system was perpetuated by men, the only people with any power, and existed to benefit and privilege men at the expense of women. And so we're kind of stacking up a house of cards in these assumptions, which all depend on the adjacent ones being demonstrably true in order for any of it to really make any sense. Which means that if I can demonstrate that women were historically able to have a major influence on society, say, a couple hundred years ago, you know, long before they had the vote, long before anybody had to pander to their, their wishes, um, it would follow that, one, the women's lobby is powerful, probably all the more powerful since female suffrage and the passage of equal rights legislation, and two, that feminism is fundamentally wrong about the historical balance of power in society, and what the causes for it were. Now, to kind of preface, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about evolution and uh, natural selection and stuff like that. I know it's science-y, but just try and stay put. I'll try and make it seem interesting. One thing I found kind of interesting recently is that Barack Obama has stated publicly that he makes no decision, no major decision, without running it past his wife first. Now, Bill Clinton made a similar statement uh, when he was president, something about how America was getting two presidents for the price of one. Now, what I kind, kind of find interesting about that is that uh, unless he's just lying through his teeth and pandering to women, uh, there is a woman who essentially has informal veto power over the political decisions of the U.S., and she was never elected to office. Because she wasn't elected, she can't be held politically accountable for her husband's decisions, uh, even if those decisions were based on hers. Yet Obama sees her influence over his decisions as president as a good thing, uh, rather than as a moral hazard. Now, there's a couple of old adages that, uh, that you might recognize uh, from history. Uh, they're supported by like a ton of examples uh, in real life, actual history, and in fiction. And they go something like this. Behind every great man is a great woman. And also, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Now, if we're going to assume there's any truth in these two adages, and the cultural examples that support them, including recent research that children learn sexist attitudes primarily from their mothers and not their fathers, we have to at least consider the possibility that up until very recently, overt power maybe wasn't something the average woman wanted much to do with. If behind every great man is a great woman, and if the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, then women would have been able to convince men to allow them into those roles. And there are women through history who have been in those roles of the head of state, right, of leaders of armies, the whole bit. So why wouldn't women, as a collective, have wanted that? I mean, while Obama is quick to give kudos to his wife where it's due, and uh, even if 
nearly every political decision he makes is actually her decision, he gets the majority of the credit and the glory. Credit and glory is a form of accountability. It's positive accountability. You did that. Good for you. At the same time, if anyone gets impeached because of one of, of Michelle Obama's political decisions goes horribly awry, it won't be Michelle Obama, will it? In fact, I think she'll get a tidy settlement in the divorce that would no doubt ensue, and probably make a killing on speaking engagements and book sales. It's her husband who will bear any serious consequences for following her advice off a political cliff, because the buck stops with the one who has formal authority, doesn't it? What Michelle Obama enjoys is power combined with plausible deniability and immunity. And one thing that we know about history is that the buck that stopped back then was frequently one mean buck. Now, this is where things are just going to get kind of techni technical and sciency, uh, where I'll be talking about basic personality differences between men and women and why I believe those differences evolved. For anyone with a hankering for a more detailed analysis, I will direct you to my video, The Tyranny of Female Hypoagency. For now, I'm just going to do a quick rehash of a few big differences between men and women. Men score much higher than women on dominance, venturesomeness, vigilance, and emotional stability, and women markedly higher than men on warmth, affiliation, apprehension, and sensitivity. Now, these are the biggest global differences in personality. Uh, these are the ones that skew the personalities of men and women to the point where there's really only about a 10% overlap. So any assertion that these differences are completely culturally engendered is kind of putting the cart before the horse. Culture is a construct that can only exist when it's compatible with our biology, with our physio-psychological natures. And as Margaret Mead clarified upwards of a hundred times over 50 years, there is no evidence that she found, nor any reason for anyone to believe, that any human society has ever existed where gender roles were reversed. On a side note, despite her repeated public clarifications, the majority of introductory sociology textbooks still falsely credit her with the discovery of the first ever women-on-top, men-on-the-bottom society. Anyhow, moving along. The traits men score higher than women on are traits that are suited to overt status hierarchies. The kind that in the past got you big rewards if you were smart and very lucky, and big costs, as in disemboweled or beheaded, if you fucked up. There's a reason why in our much more immediately violent past, you know, back when wars were fought with close weapons that let you count your enemies' nose hairs, or where power passed to successors or usurpers from a dead man's hands, well, there's a reason why kings actually had lower life expectancies than serfs. Likewise, back in the day when an officer had to view the battle through binoculars or his own eyes rather than on a screen, rates of death for officers were often higher than those for low-ranking soldiers. Now, considering how dangerous all this stuff is, you know, how likely it is to kill you before you hit the age of 20, how is it that men evolved to be so suited for it? I mean, wouldn't those dead men be genetic dead ends selected out of the gene pool? Well, sure, but the ones who made it to the top of the pile of male bodies, well, they tended to get a lot of pussy, and thereby pass on a lot of copies of their genes. I mean, look at Mick Jagger. Literally, a man as physically attractive as a sow's bunghole after a round of dysentery. He's got a lot more women eager to fuck him than that good-looking fit guy with the nice, steady accounting job. His estimated number of sexual conquests exceeds 4,000. Back in the days before the pill, that would mean a lot of little Jagger boys out there, wouldn't it? Most or all of them sharing some of his do-or-die, risk-taking attitude. You know, the one that... Uh, made him willing to risk being a loser garage band singer working part-time at the 7-Eleven and living in his mother's basement in the w on the one and God knows how many chance that he was going to make some serious bank and get some fame. According to Henry Kissinger, yet another physically bottom 50 percenter and sexual top 5 percenter, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac, one even Marilyn Monroe allegedly couldn't resist. But that doesn't seem to be the case for Madeleine Albright. Somehow, her power doesn't have Calvin Klein models and hunky soccer players beating a path to her bedroom door. 
and even if it did, by the time she'd acquired that kind of power, it wouldn't do her genetic interest much good, would it? Even if someone as hot as Brad Pitt wanted to have his way with her, producing a child from that would have required technology that didn't exist for perimenopausal women back in our caveman past. The whole time she was busy acquiring political power and not getting herself knocked up, she was ensuring that few girls would carry on her personality traits. And even if she had had a handful of kids, it wouldn't mean she could field her own division of platoons full of go get em take charge power hungry daughters. So, for men, power meant potential, big potential social, political, and sexual rewards and staggering reproductive career-ending potential costs. And the only reason males evolved to have the traits conducive to gambling in this way is because when the winners of such games are men, they can produce dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of progeny who share those very traits. Evolution, remember, doesn't care about anything other than copies of genes. It doesn't care if you're nice, mean, stupid, star smart, happy, miserable, long-lived, or dead at 25. All it cares about is how many copies of yourself you made. Not a woman in history or now, no matter how powerful and attractive she was, could have pulled a Genghis Khan, who produced upwards of a thousand children, making virtually every other man in the, the vicinity fear and respect him, and making at least half of them also wish he were dead. So now perhaps you can understand how and why women not only did not evolve traits uh, on the whole that would motivate them towards seeking overt political power, but traits that would often also lead them to avoid status-seeking in risky, dangerous, competitive environments. You know, apprehension, sensitivity, traits that only handicap you when you're required to risk and fight and bleed and persevere to get to the top. And it goes even further than this. Because ask yourself, how well was Cleopatra's genetic interest served by dying at 38 and exposing her not-yet-grown, acknowledged progeny to the regicidal politics of the day? Who was left to carry on her genes? On the other hand, how many children, legitimate and bastard, could a Julius Caesar have sired before he was killed? How many male offspring did he pass his bold, power-thirsty, high-stakes gambler genes to? And how many of them were illegitimate? and therefore not targeted for assassination. Overt power is dangerous and risky, Danielle, even now, because overt power invites accountability. And while accountability means your signature and not your spouse is, is on a piece of legislation, even if she convinced you to sign it, and your picture is the one to hang in the hall of presidents, even if she was pulling your strings during your ascent to power, it also means you get to take the blame when things go wrong or you make a mistake, and in the past, those things often led to death for yourself and all of your acknowledged male progeny. Hence the Michelle Obamas of the world, and the Eleanor of Aquitaines, and the Elizabeth Bathories, the female power behind the throne who doesn't get her head chopped off. One of feminism's biggest blind spots has always been the price that overt social, legal, and political dominance historically demanded of the men who sought it, and the men who didn't, it ignores the mound of mostly male bodies, and instead sees only the, in their minds, unfair and undeserved power of the man seated for his usually abbreviated life on the throne on top. It compares the historical position of those who were rarely allowed to gamble to the few men who gambled and won, rather than the many men who gambled and lost. And it assumes that there has ever existed a history in which women on the whole would have even wanted that same right to gamble to risk dying in a trench, getting stabbed in the Senate, being executed for the bad luck of being the wrong person's acknowledged heir, when they could be a proverbial Lady Macbeth, a woman with tremendous influence and no one but herself to hold her fully accountable when her own ambitions blow up in her face. This is how women's historical position relative to men has always worked. Women influence, they manipulate, they persuade, and they demand, and while they don't usually hold formal power, and got little enough credit for anything good that happened other than those adages I mentioned earlier, they've also managed to duck a ton of historical blame. Blame that feminists are still ducking on behalf of women, and even on behalf of historical feminists the world over. I mean, feminists are looking at history through a lens of what women would want now, right? Not what women would want back then, right? 
And so they assume that because women didn't take that stuff or weren't given that stuff, that they, you know, they must have wanted it because in this environment, women do want it, right? In this nice, safe, easy, democratic environment where leaders, uh, leadership changes hands through elections and not, you know, bloody coups, uh, feminists assume that, that women 500 years ago would want these same things, and this is just not the case. And they assume that women not having it meant that they had no power, and that's absolutely not the case either. I mean, feminists judge women's status in society 500 years ago based on the environment that we live in today, and they assume that women had inferior status in society because uh, men were holding them down, and not because women were choosing to have that status and the privilege that went along with it. I mean, there's certainly plenty of evidence, uh, historical evidence, showing that women really didn't feel that subjugated. You want an example? In the 1600s, a group of women petitioned the King of England to ban coffee houses because drinking coffee had Frenchified their husbands, made them lackluster in bed, and recalcitrant at home and at work. Setting aside the failure of this petition to convince the king, who I assume must have been fond of coffee, would such a petition even have existed? Would any woman of that era have ever seen it as an endeavor worthy of her time and effort if women felt they had no influence on the movers and shakers in society? If they understood that they were mere slaves, subjugated and oppressed for the benefit of men, and expected their concerns to be ignored out of hand, because men in power can't be influenced by them. Or if they feared punishment or reprisal from those oppressive men who had created society for the primary purpose of exploiting and enslaving women for their benefit. I'm going to link to the text of that position, petition in the low bar. I'm sure that upon reading it, Danielle, you'll detect the tone of censure and demand in it, the air of hubris and expecting the king will give them what they want, and the derisive shaming they do of their Frenchified men who can't even get it up like the Spaniards anymore because of that horrible coffee. This is not a document written by a class of people living under someone's boot heel. It's a document written by women who feel entitled to make demands of the king based on their right to expect a standard of behavior from their husbands, fathers, and sons, and who have every expectation that the king will listen to them. Another example from 1600. Uh, from a book by Lucrezia Marinella um, that really doesn't sound like women considered themselves subjugated, oppressed, or enslaved, enslaved. Quote, It is an amazing thing to see in our city the wife of a shoemaker or a butcher or a porter dressed in silk with chains of gold at the throat, with pearls and rings of good value, and then, in contrast, to see her husband cutting the meat all smeared with cow's blood, poorly dressed. But whosoever considers this carefully will find it reasonable, because it is necessary that the lady, even if low-born and humble, be draped with such clothes for her natural excellence and dignity, and the man be less adorned as if a slave or a little ass born to her service. Yeah. She sure seemed to feel that women were subjugated and enslaved. And all this talk of coffee houses and butchers aside, it's not like women haven't had their victories. Uh, certainly not the case. Uh, the last time a group of women decided it would be a good idea to ban something people like to drink. The suffragettes and the Women's Christian Temperance League almost single-handedly brought about pro prohibition in the U.S. And hey, they did it before women had the vote. The really cool thing is that most of the rhetoric surrounding the temperance movement revolved around drink causing men to be lazy, to suck at their jobs, and to be mean to women. In other words, booze made men not behave the way women wanted them to. That certainly doesn't reflect the attitude and demeanor of an oppressed class, does it? It actually reflects a sense of entitlement on the part of at least a small group of women to dictate standards of behavior for men on behalf of all women. And what I find just absolutely awesome is that the feminists of the day used to put on plays depicting brutal, vulgar, beastly men made more beastly by drink and inflicting their beastliness on the hapless women in their lives to scare women and shame well-meaning men into supporting their efforts. Sounds almost white ribbony, doesn't it? It's like second verse, same as the first.
and all the others. This seems to be the single most pervasive emotional argument feminists have, have always employed. If you don't do X, whether X is to pass some law or policy, or change some hierarchy, or amend your terms of service, or censor this person, or fire that person, it will harm women, or worse, cause men to harm women. This seems to be the go-to tactic for feminists right from the get-go. It's either sexual shaming, victim posturing, demonization of men, or some combination thereof. Save the damsels, or you're a misogynist. Support the damsels, or good luck getting laid. Free birth control and abortions for the damsels, or you're just sexists who want to control women's bodies. March through a clothesline for the damsels, or you support the rape of women. Lips that touch liquor will never touch ours. Temperance activist Carrie Nation even went on a rampage of shouting, shaming, and vandalism to bring attention to her cause, marching into bars and busting up the place. Provocative behavior, to be sure, without ever once provoking a beating or raping from one of those brutal, oppressive, and drunken males. Still, that didn't stop enough people from buying the shtick that booze in the glass meant women bruised and bloody on the kitchen floor. And again... I have to wonder how the poor, helpless, teetotaling darlings didn't realize they were subjugated and in no position to demand anything of government or to have any expectations of men. Didn't they know they had no power in society and no influence on the decisions of government that affected them and were just slaves at the mercy of all those brutal, oppressive men who held formal power and had the vote when they didn't? Interestingly enough, the decision to ban alcohol resulted in countless, mostly male, deaths and prosecutions all kinds of civic unrest and mayhem, before government finally gave up on the whole idea of it. Mostly male deaths and jail sentences, despite an equal number of female consumers. So, you're looking at the origins of organized crime in the U.S., a drug war with heaps of dead male bodies and hundreds if not thousands of men going to prison, based on women's activism, changing the laws of an entire nation, even before politicians had any reason to give a shit about courting their votes. And the sweetest irony is that alcohol consumption and its social harms are not sexually directional. But the fight for prohibition succeeded by turning alcohol into a gendered issue that harmed and endangered women and turned men into brutal, rapey bastards. By claiming to speak for all women, capitalizing on female victimhood, and demonizing men, a relatively small, screechy bunch of women managed to convince the entire government of a nation, a government led by no one but men, to change the law, make life difficult, and limit civil liberties for everyone, including other women. I don't know who that reminds me of. Everything I'm talking about here is part of the great logical black hole of feminism. If feminism is at all accurate in its beliefs about the nature of society and men and how men are with women, then feminism itself could never have existed. The oppressive males who built society to benefit themselves at the expense of women would have nipped that shit in the bud the moment them women started getting uppity. And they could do it, too. The white-battering, woman-raping, violent, power-hungry, physically larger and stronger, testosterone-poisoned brutes that they are. Hell, if women had no influence on how society works or on the decisions of government, if men really were interested in oppressing women, keeping them down for men's benefit, how did women's suffrage happen in the first place? Given that every member of Congress or Parliament, every single government body who voted it into law, was a man, and every police officer who never turned a fire hose or shot a rubber bullet at any suffragette was also a man. Further, how is it that women got for free what, when, what men were still being required to pay for as a condition of their citizenship and personhood? And it's not like the draft was the only public obligation men had that women didn't. Chivalry was, and still is, a social obligation, expected of men. Just ask Obama and Biden, who recently admonished men, and only men, to step in when they saw a woman being abused. Beyond that, before the days of big government, huge bureaucracies, and ginormous tax bases, any police officer could, at any time, commandeer the assistance of any adult male bystander to help him control a crowd, break up a brawl, or detain a suspect, regardless of any physical risk to that man. A fire department official could commandeer the efforts of every adult male in the vicinity to of a fire to form an unpaid bucket brigade, even if they had other things they'd rather be doing at the moment, like, I don't know, going to their paid job? None of those duties or obligations applied to women, Danielle. 
not because they were weaker. A woman can pass a bucket of water to the next guy just as easily as anyone else, but because they had an exemption, the exemption of female privilege. They didn't owe society, you see. Society owed them. And you can see that attitude alive and well in every single demand from modern feminists. What do society and men owe women today? Now, I'm almost positive you're not completely convinced yet, so I'm going to provide some more examples of the nature of the power of women and those who lobby on behalf of women, and, uh, and how that is wielded over men and society. When Obama unveiled his initial economic stimulus plan, which he called Shovel Ready, and which had allocated about 80% of the money to jobs in male sectors, which had seen about 80% of all job losses, a coalition of feminist groups demanded and were granted a face-to-face -face with him and his advisors, and within no time, over 40% of the stimulus money was allocated to female-dominated sectors, mainly health and education, that had actually gained jobs during the recession, and a significant portion was allocated to uh, promote female participation in male sectors, in other words, to compete directly with males for newly created jobs. The recession was the first time the male unemployment rate drastically outpaced the female unemployment rate in the U.S., and while women have mostly recovered, men are still trying to catch up. This has been the pattern of every major recession uh, for the last hundred years. How about another example? Not quite so modern. In the mid to late 1800s, women lobbying on behalf of all women women who didn't even have the vote, mind you, so politicians had no reason to care about them and every reason to pander to their husbands, over what had become an unfairly gendered system of property rights resulted in the amendment of several statutes across the Western world relating to individual and marital property. Laws had previously stipulated that any property a woman brought with her into a marriage was to be controlled by her husband. Though dower rights of various kinds did exist in different places, which could restrict what a man was legally permitted to do with properties gifted to or inherited by his wife, and even with his own properties, he was still considered the legal trustee of any and all property held by his wife and minor children, and any and all incomes earned by that wife and minor children. Keep in mind, this arrangement didn't really negatively affect the vast majority of women prior to the Industrial Revolution. In most marriages, the question of property was kind of non-relevant because there was none, and the question of income was equally irrelevant as there was, like, hardly any. Most labor at that time was essentially unpaid. Farmers would pay their rents and grain, and they would feed their families with most of what was left over. All family members worked toward providing for the family in whatever largely non-wage-earning capacity they were best suited to. Hardly anyone owned anything worth bickering over. At the same time, all men through all strata of society had a socially and legally enforced obligation to provide for the material needs of their families. Married women, on the other hand, had no such enforceable obligation even toward their own children. Their exemption from this obligation and the accountability inherent in it was, in fact, a primary justification for giving power of conservator conservatorship of assets and income to husbands. The people with the ultimate accountability should have the ultimate authority. Women's exemption from this often costly accountability, you know, there were all kinds of things like debtors prisons back then, was actually preserved by their lack of formal authority. So these laws really generally benefited primarily wealthy landowning men and harmed primarily the already privileged wives of wealthy landowners. And it was a mostly even trade-off for pretty much everybody else. And unless there was going to be a separate system for the rich and the poor, the harm of male authority to the few women living in relative comfort at the top of society was more than balanced out by the benefit of male obligation to the many, many women at the bottom who had no property to fight over and every need for the obligatory support of their husbands. For the vast majority of men, those in the lower classes, this arrangement was at least as much burden as benefit. A single man could subsist on a tiny percentage of the work required to support a family, but it was expected that he take a wife and provide for her and any children, and to provide for any female relatives who were unmarried or widowed. In fact, children's privilege, the privilege of legally and socially enforceable material support for one's family, typically ended at age 21 for men, but was a lifelong deal for women. During the Industrial Revolution, 
with the emergence of a cash economy and the influx of working class men, women, and children into the paid workforce. All of a sudden, there was property to fight over, and the women's lobby leaped to action and fought hard to protect the interest of women in their property. And uh, what resulted was equal property rights within marriage, right? Yeah, no. What feminists of the day managed to do was emancipate women's property and income not only from their husbands, but from the institution of family altogether, while simultaneously leaving men's legal financial obligations to all family members unchanged. In essence, a married woman's property was now her sole property as an individual, while a married man's property remained the communal property of the family. Hmm. If I'm not mistaken, we have something similar to that attitude even today among rich and poor. It goes something like this. What's mine is mine, honey, and what's yours is ours. I'm going to link to the text of a 1910 article published in the New York Times in the low bar for your perusal. The woman who wrote it, an anti-suffragette, quoted from then-decades-old New York State statutes to refute the argument of a suffragette who had claimed it was unfair to women that they did not have an equal say over marital assets. Now, here is what that suffragette was framing as unfair to women. Here is the situation as it stood in 1910. Under the law of the time, a woman's property and income were solely hers, to dispose of or spend as she saw fit. A man's property and income were considered the property and income of the marriage, and he had a legal obligation to use said income and property to provide for the material needs of his wife and children. He had no control over his wife's property, even if it was gifted to her by him. At the same time, her life interest in his property meant that he could not sell certain types of property that he solely owned without her permission. If she depended on that property, say, a house she lived in or wanted to live in, she could prevent him from selling it. But wait, it gets better. If she had property or income, and she chose to, she could legally leave her husband and children to starve. And if she did financially support them, say, for a period where he was out of work, she could then seek reimbursement in court from him for every dime she'd spent on his, their children's, and her own upkeep. But wait, Danielle, it gets even better. In addition to this very equal balancing of property rights within marriage, the balancing of debt obligation was a really sweet deal for those privileged men. He was liable for all the family debts, including hers, while she was liable for none of them. All debts generated by members of his family were his debts, even if that debt involved a loss relating to her solely and independently held property. In other words, if she took her own income and then single-handedly gambled her way into a huge debt, she couldn't be made to sell her diamond earrings to pay it, even if he'd given them to her, but he would be required to sell his watch fob. This liability and obligation persisted even if a couple were living apart within a legal separation, even if that separation was due to the wife's unilateral choice. The second point that the suffragette had was that, prop, uh, was that rights over children were unfair to women because even though under the statute women were equal custodians and guardians of their children with equal rights over how their children were raised, the father controlled the child's income. You know, the person who has the responsibility to keep the child alive gets to control the child's income. This was the state of marital property affairs in New York State in 1910, and the ink on those statutes had been dry for about 40 years. Women had earned independent property rights within marriage, but men were still required to bear every ounce of financial responsibility toward women and children. And not only did the women's lobby, you know, that group you want everyone to believe isn't really powerful, not only did they manage to pull this off before women even had the vote, they then managed to convince the entire Western world that the arrangement was still unfair to women because the party with no responsibility for the material support of anyone, even herself, did not have an equal say over the marital property. Does that really sound like women collectively 
had no real power? Does it sound like feminism has no real power? And why on earth would a feminist like you attempt to disavow that power, if not to maintain plausible deniability and immunity and avoid c collective blame if things go Pete Tong? A pretense of weakness and ineffectuality to avoid being held responsible for one's actions? We did that when everyone believes it was just, and then we're just women, we have no real power, when anyone starts to notice they've been sold a bill of goods. Kind of like how I constantly hear feminists refer to default mother custody after divorce as a patriarchal norm. It's not feminists' fault. Except that it is. The Tender Years Doctrine was also a result of early feminist advocacy, again long before government had any reason to buy women's non-existent votes. Under traditional systems, men were given default custody of children because men had sole financial responsibility for the material needs of those children. In the case of a divorce, a man gained full custody of the children and retained full responsibility for the remaining portion of his family. A woman lost custody of her children, but bore no further responsibility toward those children or her husband. This situation was deemed egregiously unfair to women, I'm guessing because it made women cry. Especially once women's increasing financial independence from men had upped the divorce rate enough that it affected more than just a minuscule percentage of them. Women were being harmed. They were crying and upset. Something had to be done. With the enactment of the Tender Years Doctrine, women received default custody of all young, dependent children. Hooray! Oddly enough, however, women did not, for some strange reason, receive sole financial responsibility for those children, nor even for themselves. The Tender Years Doctrine gave all custody rights to women, but did not impose custody responsibilities on women, as had been the standard case for fathers under patriarchy. She now got the benefits, he got the bill. I consistently hear feminists framing paternal custody financed solely by fathers under traditional systems as unfair to women and male patriarchal privilege. But the earliest feminists saw maternal custody financed by fathers as, well, I'm not sure how they justified it, but it's important to note that with few exceptions, feminists are still justifying it. Whatever it is, it isn't privilege. And this is one of the reasons I believe feminism is based on hate. Because these laws granting women the rights of men without imposing on them the responsibilities men historically bore were enacted by what feminists universally describe as an evil oppressive patriarchy whose primary function was to subjugate women for men's uniform benefit. And they were signed into law well before politicians had any need to pander to women voters. Huh. It almost seems as if the core purpose of the patriarchy was not to subjugate and enslave women, but to accommodate their every need, wish, and demand the moment they voiced it and it became revo remotely feasible for men to do so. Remnants of these early feminist efforts still persist today. There's the issue of lifetime alimony in Florida and other U.S. states, strong mother bias in family courts across the Western world, and in Michigan, it's still illegal for a man to sell his house, even if he's the only name on the title without his wife's permission even as she can do whatever the fuck she wants with her own house. As an aside, I'm sure that's a super fun law for a technically still married man to deal with during the divorce negotiations when he's facing his and, her own, and his ex-wife's legal bills and needs to liquidate his assets to pay for them. So, to put it all in perspective, suffragettes actually had the gall to complain that women did not have equal right of decision over men's property and income even while he was legally obligated to support his dependents, including her with it, and she had no such obligation toward him or the children. Decades after women's property and income had been emancipated from their husband's power of decision. Yay! Fuck those privileged male assholes! Go team woman! Woo! The women's lobby also demanded and received the sole right to custody of minor children without the corresponding burden men had always borne along with that right, the sole obligation to support those children. When they weren't telling the world this arrangement was still unfair to women, they were calling it equality. And I suppose they were correct in a way. Women's rights were becoming roughly equivalent to men's obligations. And the extra awesomest thing about all of this is that contemporary feminists will almost always claim that mother bias in family court is 
the patriarchy. The Tender Years Doctrine and its lingering effects and the maintenance of male obligations while handing unencumbered rights to women? None of that was women's fault. I mean, how could that even be possible? Not only were women powerless and subjugated, they didn't even have the vote. More than that, feminists will even turn around and insist that mother bias in family court is an oppression of women because it means society views caring for children as women's work. And they can say this with a straight fucking face, even though mothers are under no obligation to take advantage of that bias and have every freedom to share custody rights with their ex-husbands. Feminists will likewise claim that alimony is actually sexist against women because it implies women can't be self-sufficient, even though no woman on earth is under any legal or social obligation to ask for or collect it. In fact, feminists will actually say, without even letting out a giggle, that a man denied access to his children because of a false domestic violence accusation made by his ex-wife, all while being threatened with jail for non-payment of alimony she doesn't need and didn't have to ask for, is an example of misogyny. I mean, heck, even women's free choices and unfair behavior can be twisted into an imagined oppression as long as people are prepared to entertain this gibberish as anything more than incoherent excuse-making. Feminists are free to fuel the engine of actual legal subjugation of an entire gender class just by playing the victim. I mean, it's almost as if feminists are continuing the age-old female tradition of plausible deniability. You know, the women who brought about the Tender Years Doctrine and marital property laws, they were just the voice whispering in the ear, not the hand holding the pen that signed all of this bullshit into law. They were the Lady Macbeth, without even the decency to admit they'd done something unjust, let alone the conscience required to off themselves about it. They're the Lady Macbeth who blamed her husband for everything, then attached herself to the nearest powerful man who was still standing, and went right back to seeking power by talking somebody else, the patriarchy, into taking the risks in the fall. I asked you at the end of my last video to think about Warren Farrell's quote that men's greatest weakness was their facade of strength, and women's greatest strength was their facade of weakness. Your bizarre belief that women have always been essentially powerless within a system that subjugated them, and that feminism is not as powerful as Eric thinks, is only more evidence of that gendered dishonesty. Because I have the feeling, Danielle, that if women today were forced to bear the extra obligations that went along with the extra rights and authority men had in the past, you and your feminist friends would be screaming foul. Oh wait, people have tried to suggest women bear those responsibilities, and the women's lobby has managed to take care of that right quick, every time. I mean, I get nothing but grief from feminists whenever I suggest that mothers with sole custody of ch and guardianship of children, especially those who unilaterally chose to have children out of wedlock, should bear the sole responsibility to support those children. I mean, this is what it was like for those super-privileged men back in the day, a divorced father got the kids, and he got the entire job of feeding them, and his ex-wife didn't owe him or them one damn thing. That kind of responsibility would be unfair to women, wouldn't it? It would make women cry. It would be misogyny and child abuse, even though you feminists describe it as male privilege when, back in the day, the sexes were reversed. The tools evolution gave women to influence society aren't the same ones it gave men. They're the social, emotional, cognitive tools that have allowed feminists to turn reality on its head, leave out or actively suppress half the evidence, and convince virtually everyone that this is how things all really work. Better language skills, greater social cognition, greater emotional skills, and the benign, unthreatening mask of a neotenous female face, and the pretense of female weakness even while they've historically engaged in intimidation, death threats, violence, vandalism, arson, information suppression, demonization of opponents, deceit, academic fraud, lunacy, censorship, and smear campaigns. And you're going to tell me that women don't know how to influence society. Yeah. Anyhow, that's all I have to say about that ridiculous, preposterous uh, assertion that feminism isn't as powerful as I or Eric think it is, that uh, women aren't powerful, that uh, that history was just one big freaking party of... it was a theme party 
a subjugation of women theme party. You know, that's really not how it was. Um, that's really not how I think women felt it was back then. And uh, it's only since holding power has gotten to be less and less physically risky that women have even been interested in it. So, you know, there you go. That's my assessment. That's part two of my response to you, Danielle. And I'm thinking I might just tackle the domestic violence and marital rape thing um, in another video, or maybe I will simply uh, address you to um, a, a video where I've already addressed these things. So, anyhow, that's it for me, and uh, I guess I will see you guys all later.